morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you may be. Uh, thanks so much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to join us um, and to hear today from the wonderful uh, Ben Garcia. We're going to talk a little bit about what is happening with Ben at the new museum um, and some of the big ideas that a place that is as thoughtful and as uh, and as as thought provoking as the institution is. Looks like we're getting the the <laughs> the slides up here that come up in pieces. So all right, there we go. We've got pictures up. This is always better with pictures. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead, Cassidy, if you want to advance the slide. Oh, Ben's putting in a link in there. Awesome. Um, for those of us who are joining for the for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, my name is Braden Painter. I am the Director of Methodology and Practice at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. And if you're running across the coalition for the first time, the coalition is a network of museums, historic sites, parks, places of memory, memory initiatives around the world. More than 350 members in more than 65 countries, all of whom come together to use the power of place and the past to help people become engaged in the communities around them and build more just and humane futures. Uh, you can learn more about the coalition at our website, sitesofconscience.org, or through the many, many social media channels that we are a part of as well. There's great stories about sites like Ben's and many others um, around the world to follow there. So please do check it out as we have time. All right, go ahead. All right, we can skip. <laughs> there we go. And so Ben, Ben Garcia, um, this is the moment I have, we're doing this live and I have lost the screen with your bio. It's coming back here. Uh, come on, come on. I could do most of it by by memory, but right, yeah, I can do it words. Here we go. All right, so Ben Garcia has worked for more than 20 years to help Museums become places of welcome and belonging for all people. He started as a gallery guide and educator, moved to onto exhibition development, and then served in middle and upper management administrative roles before joining the American LGBTQ Plus Museum as its inaugural executive director. Uh, he has presented and published regularly on creating structural equity in museums through decolonizing and fair labor practice and by centering missing voices and perspectives. Um, and that's the official version of this. And my personal unofficial is that Ben is uh, a longtime member of the coalition and always a warm and thoughtful and caring person to be around who um, I have learned a lot from and was just saying we were using some of his writing with a, with, with a project the other day. So it's always wonderful to hear from you, Ben. Thanks, Brayden. All right. Um, Cassidy, I don't think we have a ton of slides today. So if you drop, we're just going to have a conversation because Ben, right, as the head of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum is launching this amazing new project which brings up all kinds of questions and a ton for us to learn from and to get excited about. So this is a chance to hear and learn from, uh, from Ben as you're taking on this project. So I wondered for if you could just get us started by telling us about the museum, where things are now and where they're gonna be headed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are in the startup phase of creating um, a museum of LGBTQ plus history and culture here in the United States. Um, it will be sited at, in New York City. We have, uh, you know, we were founded by a coalition of activists and advocates. Um, we have a commitment to doing all of the work that we do in partnership. And um, our primary partnership around our home base, our site in New York, is the New York Historical Society. That is um, New York State's first museum and soon to be the home of New York's newest museum, the American LGBTQ Plus Museum. Um, they are building an addition to their existing structure, and we will occupy the fourth floor of that building. That'll open in, uh, we anticipate that that will open in October 2026. So between now and then, we're doing a lot of work planning, fundraising, 
Um, and we've began uh, a series of public programs um, and a bunch of partnership work as well. So we'll be doing some pop-up exhibitions and a few traveling exhibitions before we open. It's gonna be fun to see each piece of this um, unfold. Uh, and you are really creating something new that's gonna live across the country, that's gonna live in a physical space, that's gonna live in digital spaces. Um, and anytime you're creating something new like that, it means you're often working at the edge of knowns and unknowns. And so what are some of the unresolved questions that are still to be answered by, the, by this project? Yeah, it's a, um, that I think a lot about that, uh, you know, as an organization that is committed to certain core values, um, centering racial, gender, and disability justice, um, which really for us means moving beyond paradigms of equity and sort of doing justice work, which is about tearing down structures and creating new structures that support that. Um, there are so many unknowns because um, there are not very many models for us to follow, although by there certainly are some. Um, so some of the unknowns still, um, that commitment to doing all of our work in partnership, every, you know, all of our programs, all of our program development, all our exhibitions, um, as we create our digital platform and sort of uh, make a more robust space there, you know, what that will look like um, exactly, you know, will be different in, you know, for each context. So, you know, we have the commitment, we have a short, you know, existing history of, of doing some of those partnerships, but all of that is still to come. Um, you know, we are, I think, you know, the other piece that is still, not fully formed is uh, another core commitment, which is that we want to be a museum that is part of the movement for LGBTQ plus um, equality and liberation and not just documenting that history. And so what does it mean to be a museum that is also a site for activism? Um, I know that's something that a lot of the coalition members think about regularly and have great experience with. What is that exactly going to look like um, for such a broad and multifaceted community as the one that we're trying to represent um, is to be determined. But of course, we are going into that with an awareness of the ways in which queer people have harmed other queer people historically. Um, and, you know, aware of the legacy of white supremacy and of patriarchy within the LGBTQ rights movement, um, aware that we really need to center the histories, lives, and safety of um, BIPOC members and uh, gender queer and transgender members, because they are the ones who regularly face um, the most, uh, you know, the most threat in the majority culture, as we're seeing now as transgender um, rights and access to uh, gender affirming health care are under attack everywhere. Um, and, um, and also within our community. And so we have a lot of work to do um, in terms of content exhibitions that are focused not on sort of the broader population to help them understand our histories, but within our communities to help us understand our own histories and the ways in which we have um, participated in uh, sort of internalized oppression, you know, and oppression within, within our communities. So what does all that look like? You know, uh, I have some sense, you know, we are, we're pulling together partners, we're pulling together our creative team, we're pulling together our um, advisory groups, um, but, you know, it's still all to be determined and um, it's a very exciting time to be entering this kind of conversation because of the polarization, because of the urgency, um, you know, really being thoughtful about how you enter this in a way where there's space for people to really listen and be heard is, of course, the biggest challenge for, for cultural organizations right now. Um, and for the folks who are listening now to the conversation, um, we will do a more direct 
conversation between you all and Ben right at the end for Q and A. But if there's stuff that's coming up in the middle, right? <laughs> those I think we could spend an hour or two just starting to dive into each parts of um, that last answer. Please be starting to put stuff in the chat. Things that are on your mind, things that you have questions about, uh, suggestions um, for how to answer some of these big questions. Go ahead and start adding those into the chat. Uh, maybe one of the threads to pull on out of there, just because I know it's been a part of your work elsewhere, um, is you've thought a lot about uh, intersectionality in the in each of the places that you've you've been in your career, and that's going to take on a very particular and different set of uh, facets at this particular moment. Um, and so how is intersectional process really important to the work here? And what are some of the ways you're already seeing it starting to play out? Um, one of the reasons that I was really excited about this opportunity was the board that had formed to move this project from its inception to the point when they hired me a year ago. So in 2017, a small group of longtime activists and advocates um, in the LGBTQ rights movement got together to talk about what a museum that told the story of that movement um, and sort of reached back to, to before the modern movement as well, you know, would be. And they formed a board very intentionally to, um, to ensure that this would not be a museum that told, um, you know, th that, that told a story that sort of perpetuated the, uh, you know, the, the, the biases that you know, are written into history and written into, into our movement. And so what that meant was they were very intentional about making sure that the board was majority, uh, represented majority um, people of color, um, that it had the rep representation of, of the full spectrum of gender identity. Um, and it was a it is a board that, you know, is very deeply rooted in advocacy, activism, and also phil philanthropy, um, you know, especially sort of foundation work geared toward LGBTQ plus organizations. Um, so I was coming in to work with a board that rather than me as the executive director, you know, that rather than the dynamic that is has so often been the case for me in my career, where I am working with boards to help them understand sort of the, the business and the values rationale for moving into constructs of greater equity and inclusion. Um, instead, now I have a board that's constantly pushing me around how do we operationalize the concepts of racial justice, gender justice, and disability justice? How do we ensure that those are perpetuated in the organization, that those are sustainable, and that those um, exceed the ten years of any of them or or myself, um, and it's such a, an incredible pleasure to be in an organization where that's the dynamic from the board to the staff rather than vice versa. So I feel like that's you know a really great opportunity. You know we have such a we have a lot of people with a lot of um, amazing work, you know, behind them that they have done and that they are doing currently. Um, and so, you know, I feel like at the baseline, we've got lots of eyes on the project that are looking through that lens. And that's going to be helpful because we will make mistakes. We will still have awareness gaps, but I think we will have fewer of those based on this board and on the team that we're building here. Um, so that intersectional work, you know, our vision is of a world in which um, all people experience the joy of liberation. And so that really is about all people. That really is about a context of intersectionality. And Irvishi Ved, who um, passed away 
uh, about six months ago and was a founding board member of our organization, you know, really embodied and um, was a lifelong advocate for intersectional liberation. Um, and, you know, her values and her vision for a museum that is also a school for activists is very much at the heart of what we're doing. And so um, we're just trying to make sure that as we develop our operations and our um, policies and our procedures, that we are creating them in ways that support um, an intersectional approach that really um, address you know, the sort of redress the historic um, imbalance within uh, queer organizations and um, moves us forward, um, you know, in very practical ways. And, you know, that's sort of, you know, we can sort of dig into sort of how you operationalize intersectionality and racial justice and gender justice and disability justice. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of ways that we do that. And it sort of starts with things like, you know, uh, you know, uh, economic and compensation equity, um, you know, decisions about sort of how you're going to support people who, um, you know, who are also caregivers, you know, in their lives, you know, how do you support the full lives of people? Um, how do you make sure that people who don't have sort of generational wealth as part of their, um, as part of their background have access to and can sort of find a role and thrive in their role and not have to get a second job within the organization. Um, so there's just lots of ways in which this goes, but it's sort of like it starts with that Maslow. You have to start with like the core needs. You have to make sure that everyone can afford to shelter themselves, feed themselves, take care of their families and save some money um, in New York City. Uh, and so, you know, that starts with a context of compensation that allows people in a nonprofit organization to do that without getting a second job. Yeah, that's, these are really big ideas. And I appreciate how you're moving between both the kind of big theory and dream of this, and also then that challenge of oper oper right, ooh, operationalizing it, right? And it feels such a place that so many organizations across the country are, um, are, are trying to think through what that means and finding new ways. Um, and you're making me wonder, right, that there's that kind of very uh, policy and procedure set of questions that we need to answer as we do this. I'm also just curious if having an, working in an organization that is thinking about liberation, that is thinking about activism in these explicit ways, that is is as a group thinking about right how that care gets uh, delivered, are there are there ways that you're finding or exploring that you're working differently, that you approach the work of this in ways that you wouldn't have expected or hadn't tried before? Are there things you're like, I don't know if this is going to work out, and three years from now we can find out if it if it does or doesn't? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the way that we are going about figuring out all of those, you know, it's as to your point, it's really important to articulate the why, the big vision, the, 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 the high level values, um, but then understanding how those translate into the day-to-day -day operations of, of an organization in a way that is sustainable, um, you know, is another piece of work. And so I would say the biggest way that we're addressing your question is um, creating a process that is co-creative and so it's not me working with an outside consultant to come up with a set of policies and procedures that make sense to me as a long time um, sort of activist within our sector um, it is about every member of the team currently we're four and we'll be eight by the end of the year sitting together and co-creating um, those policies and procedures um, so that it's not just one set of eyes or a couple of set of eyes and those eyes are not just sort of at the leadership position in the organization it's everyone in the organization while we're small um, 
co-creating that together and understanding that you're going to have a better chance of addressing the real needs and the realities of at least you know sort of all of those workplace culture and internal policies and procedures if you're if you're making that process really co-creative um and then you know as we you know and then you know i think the second part of that is really just sort of hiring people who um have been thinking have been sort of pushing against conventional thinking around um, what engagement looks like and are really sort of equally interested in that sort of um, co-creative um, framework for the work that we do. I mean, I think my, you know, my thinking is informed by the work of Paulo Freire. And, um, and I think that I just sort of naturally gravitate toward people who sort of believe that, um, you know, you're going to have a better outcome, even if it takes longer, if you're sort of including um, the people who will ultimately benefit from um, from from the effort um, in the creation of that effort. And you used a word in there, co-creation, which ties directly to a great question we got from Lara Sierra, who says, congratulations from Chile. Um, Thanks, Lara. And uh, I know that was meant for Ben. I'm thanking you. I'm yeah. saying thanks on <laughs> Ben's behalf. Uh, and uh, they write, uh, I'm interested in the curatorship of the museum. Are you thinking about a communitary or participate, participative uh, curatorship? And if so, what is the methodology? Yeah, I mean, I wish I could answer um, that question down to the methodology. Um, and I would love to talk offline with you uh, about that if you have thoughts. Um, what I do know is that, um, that we are, that our plan is to have on staff um, people who facilitate the creation of um, our programs, whether those are exhibitions or educational programs or public programs. Um, and you know, I'm not saying that we won't have curators on the team, but I tend toward, um, I tend to favor uh, a structure where you have exhibition developers on the staff and you bring in that curatorial expertise exactly as you indicate from the communities that are most able to tell the stories that need to be told in the museum. And so, um, the role of staff will be about facilitating um, knowledge from community. And community will sometimes mean academic historians. It'll sometimes be um, public historians and community historians, popular historians, and it'll sometimes, um, and, you know, it'll often be community members themselves, community um, experts, and, um, and, and people who lived through um, you know the histories or or who created the the forms that that were that we're focusing on. Um, so uh, that's sort of about as much as I know right now. But we are absolutely working to avoid stepping into any spaces of unearned authority, um, and really just trying to remember that you know it's our role to create a platform to as uh, Nina Simon says, to be the space makers uh, for those risk takers. And so our, our, our job is to create the space, to invite the perspectives in. And the place where we have expertise is on the sort of art of creating exhibitions or programs. And so we bring those artists, those developers in to work with others so that their ideas have the best chance of really resonating with the public. Uh, I think people are really excited to see what is going to get created there. Uh, Ken Torino asked um, a little bit about that, which you may not know, what should visitors expect to see and do? Um, he also asked some sort of uh, scoping questions. Are you a collecting institution and is there a national or international focus? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Ken. Um, we we did a bunch of research early on before I started um, where we talked to 
um, heads of LGBTQ archives around the country. We talk to queer historians around the country. We talk to the leaders of cultural organizations. Um, and we also did sort of a 40,000 member sort of queer household survey, and we got about 3,800 um, surveys back. So we did a bunch of research. Um, one thing that we heard really clearly from folks working in queer archives and um, similar kinds of queer history organizations is that there was real concern about us coming in as a collecting institution. There are more than 200 LGBTQ archives around the country. They are doing incredible work. Some of them are community-based. Some of them are um, based in universities almost none of them are resourced at the level that they need to be. And so to have another actor come onto the stage and sort of try to make a pitch for resources for a whole collection um, was something that they had very legitimate fear, you know, concern about. Um, so we basically underwent a process this summer where we created a committee of board members. We brought a bunch of people in to talk to the board about collecting and about sort of what it means to take on collecting at this, you know, at any stage in your organization. Um, and where we landed was that we are not going to be a collecting institution. We are going to collect in support of our core exhibition because we expect that will be up. That'll sort of have a 10 year tenure and um, to do sort of loan renewals every six months or, or so on, on something that's going to be up that long didn't make sense. So we will collect artifacts for that core exhibition. But beyond that, we will work, and this is sort of back to Braden's earlier question, like what are the things you don't know yet uh, in terms of how it's going to work? This is a big one. Um, there's an amazing organization called the Invisible Histories Project that um, basically pairs donors with archives. Um, donors of queer material with archives in four southern states. And we really are inspired by their work. And so our goal is we, we know we're going to be offered lots of collections because we've already, people are already offering us things. And so our goal is to resource that function as an intermediary so that we can connect donors to existing archives and hopefully, you know, help with sort of that financial, you know, burden as well. So we made the case to the board that um, we should be using our resources in this area to sort of help strengthen the existing ecosystem and then borrow things as we need for our exhibitions and, and um, uh, you know, and any other way in which we need to use them. So that's the plan in terms of collections. Um, we will, what should visitors expect to see and do, you know, we will have a 4,000 square foot core exhibition um, in New York at the New York Historical Society. We hope to work with the New York Historical Society in one of their, in, in their other rotating exhibition spaces to sort of always have a rotating exhibition um, going on that addresses something um, uh, that's sort of less long term. Um, but then, as I said before, you know, our plan is to work with other organizations like the Queens Museum, hopefully, or um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, other museums around the country to create content so that um, history organizations around the country will have access to sort of 1,000 to 2,000 square foot exhibitions on LGBTQ history that, um, that they can um, uh, present in their organizations so that queer people around the country can go to their local history organizations, you know, whether they're in San Antonio or in Jackson or, you know, wherever they might be and have access to, to queer history content in the museum um, and not just have to come to New York for it. So that's, that's the vision. And I think a really interesting answer there that ties back to that other conversation about what co-curating starts to mean and that this you're starting to talk about what it means to kind of co-collect and store across the country and to really have the institution be part of this much larger web and not need to be this isolated island. That's really interesting to hear about. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. I have a million more questions I want to ask and get into. Um, uh, two short things as we walk away here. Um, one is that uh, 
we will all lost a dear friend and mentor and guide and member Cinnamon Catlin Lagutko recently. And I know you in particular had a lot of time that you worked with Cinnamon. Um, is there anything that you'd like people to remember or to look at as we continue to have Cinnamon's words and work live on for us? Yeah, I mean, it is still just such a shock that we've lost Cinnamon. And I think all of us who knew Cinnamon and worked with Cinnamon, you know, probably are just sort of finding our way to what that commitment to seeing Cinnamon's work carry on, you know, looks like in each of our areas. Um, Cinnamon, one of the Cinnamon's amazing qualities was the way in which she would convene people together. I mean, she just had so, she had the largest number of people who felt like they were inner circle friends of anyone I know. And it was very authentic. She just was really there. Um, I think the book that, um, the Inclusive Museum Leader, the book that she and um, Chris Geller co-edited co is just one of the best sort of testaments to the ways in which Cinnamon inspired people to really stretch in their work toward contexts of decolonization and um, and and to re-examine the structures that um, underpin museums and change them for the better. So you know, I think that is such an important document of that work and of Cinnamon spirit. Um, but for me, I do think a lot about you know, how, um, how this museum, you know, in particular, like what's the relationship to the work that I've done over the past sort of 15 years around museum decolonization, which is very much about an indigenous context and um, how I as um, a non-indigenous person have tried to work as an ally and accomplice um, in museums toward that vision of decolonizing, like what is the relationship of that to this venture? Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, we do have um, a couple of board members who are indigenous and who are really interested in exploring sort of how do we um, address that intersection of indigeneity and queerness, um, you know, in ways that move past, I think, a very superficial understanding that a lot of people think they have around sort of two-spiritedness or, or things like that. So um, yeah, Cinnamon is, is at the forefront um, of my thinking as I think about my work ahead and her passing just added urgency um, for me to make sure that um, when I eventually joined Cinnamon, <laughs> Uh, that, um, you know, she feels like I did sort of carry the work on. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Uh, that's beautiful. Um, last question for you real quick. How can people keep up with what you're doing? How can they be involved? How can they stay in touch with this amazing project? Um, you know, the, the, thing that is sort of most helpful and hopefully easiest commitment is to just click on the link in the chat, um, scroll down and uh, join our mailing list. We have an e-newsletter that goes out once a month. We, we will not jam your mailbox, um, but that's how you can sort of learn about the progress, learn about the programs that we are doing and those that we are um, trying to amplify around the country. And then if anyone's interested in a, uh, you know, in um, a more direct involvement or partnership, uh, please just reach out to me. Um, I'll pop my email in the chat as well. And, um, you know, I'm happy to talk. And then, of course, you know, we're all, um, you know, there's also a donate button on there. So a gift of any size is incredibly helpful. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for asking that question. Good job, Mr. Director. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, ben, thank you so much for your time um, and guidance and thoughts as always. Um, and I hope people do find ways to connect with you and the work. Um, Cassidy, would you bring up the slide? We just want to let everybody know if you liked hearing from Ben, more amazing things coming. Um, let's see.
Uh, just a couple of exciting next conversations that are coming up in March. Uh, if folks have time to pop on um, memorializing sites of police violence against African Americans um, on March 16th. And we're going to lean on some of our folks to do a Reparations 101, um, who, what, where, when, and why on March 23rd. Um, and so uh, all sorts of good, uh, really good conversations coming up in the next little bit. Um, uh, we'll also, we wanna make sure that the, the conversations that we have here at the coalition are the ones that are most helpful to you and most useful in moving your work forward. So when the poll, when the Zoom closes today, there will be a quick poll. If you can fill that out, that really helps us um, understand uh, where we can where we can keep growing these. Um, with that, again, Ben Garcia, thank you so much for the work you're doing and for your time today. Um, and everyone else, thanks for taking a little bit of time out. I know a few extra minutes um, than we asked for to join us here and, and uh, be part of the conversation today. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Please be in touch. If there's somebody you heard from you want to make a connection to, that's what the coalition is here for. Um, don't be afraid to email us and we'll try and make the connections. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next conversation. All right. Have a lovely day, all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Braden. Take care.